Вот. Hey, well, good morning. Great to see everyone. Uh, fantastic to have you here uh, this morning. Please open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. And this morning we're going to read Galatians chapter 2, verses 17 to 21. Galatians chapter 2, verses 17 to to 21. Let's read. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For, though, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Let's pray. Lord, we pray this morning. As we hear your word, Lord, I pray that we would silence our hearts and minds. Lord, there's so much probably racing in our hearts and minds. And Lord, I confess even my own right now. Special sense of our weakness before you, Lord. And so we ask, Lord, could you do it again this morning? Could you speak to us, please? We pray. We thank you even through the reading of your word and through the singing of your praise. You've already been speaking to our hearts. And so, Lord, we ask that you would do exactly that again. <coughs> Lord, we pray, needing you, and needing you to move in our hearts and lives. And so, Lord, we rest in you in this moment and this time. Speak to us, we pray, in your precious name. Amen. As we think about these verses, I want us to think about a problem that we often know that we have to solve. I think all of us know that we have a problem that we have to solve. And the thing is with me, I'll admit to you, I hate solving problems. I hate solving problems. Um, Talitha, she's been doing this... Uh, computer coding, right? So let's be nerdy for a second, right? She's doing this computer coding and in this coding, she's trying to make a website. And so you've got this code and then you, from that code, they make a website. I don't know how it all works, but anyway, there's this code, it's all complicated or whatever. And then you have the website. The problem is, is you, as you look at the code, you write the code and then you look at your website and what can happen is often something will go wrong with your website. And the reason something goes wrong with your website is because there's something in the code that is missing. There's something in the code that has gone wrong. Now, some people love looking for that problem. Some people are like thrilled and excited when they see this code and they're looking in for the details and they're like, I wonder where the problem is. I was talking with Maro about this the other day. He said, I love finding the problem. I hate finding the problem. I don't like trying to solve the problem. It was the same for me when I was younger. I, I was doing Legos. You know Legos? You know, you do the Lego, and I hated following the instructions. So I'd do the Lego, and then suddenly you'd realize you've done something wrong. I would hate to solve that problem. If I've done something wrong, walk away without the spare pieces. I don't really care. I don't want to solve the problem. And as human beings, I think we need to recognize there is a problem that we have. 
And there is a problem that we need to solve. And sometimes we don't want to look in the mirror and see that problem. And sometimes we don't want to solve that problem. But we know there is a problem. And in the book of Romans, what Paul does is he spends three chapters showing people, three chapters in the book of Romans, showing everybody what problem that we have. And the problem that we have, all of us as human beings, Paul kind of sets us all aside and says, here is the problem that all of you have. The problem that all of you have is sin. Paul says this in Romans chapter 3, and we read it on Friday night. Paul says this, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. What Paul is doing is he's setting us all on the same playing field, and he's saying all of us, all of us are sinners. All of us have a problem. And so then he continues on, and this is for three chapters. He continues on in detail. You're kind of like, Paul, leave us alone for a second, but he doesn't. It's like a dog with a bone. He wants to prove to us that we have a problem. And in Romans 3.23, he says this. He concludes with this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us in this room have something in common. All of us have that problem, including the one standing here. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now the question is, how do we solve that problem? And in Galatians, there are two groups in Galatians that have two opinions as to how we solve that problem. And those two groups, they're kind of debating. And this is why Paul is writing that letter, because there's two opinions as to how you solve the sin problem of our life. There's two opinions as to how you can be justified, as to how you can be made right with God. And opinion number one is works. There's two sides of the debate. And the one side of the debate is the work side. They say, here's how we're going to solve the sin problem that we have. It is by the works of the law. That is one side of the debate. Works of the law. And so the Jews, they were saying, like, this is how we solve this problem. You need to continue circumcision. You need to continue the food laws. And in that way, we're going to solve that problem. And in our world today, many of us, we try and solve that problem by the works that we do. So we think that religious duty and religious attendance and religious practices, our own works, will solve this problem for us. If we behave ourselves, if we be good people throughout our lives, our works will solve that sin problem that we have. But then you have the other side. And the other side is Paul's side. It's not the works side to be justified, to solve the problem. It is the faith side to solve the problem. And what Paul is saying throughout this letter is you cannot be made right with God by what you do. You can only be made right with God by faith in what Christ has done for you. That's the only way to be justified. And so what Paul is doing in these verses It is quite complicated, verse 17 and 18, but essentially what Paul is doing in these verses is it's kind of like there's a debate between these two groups. And what Paul is going to do in verse 17 is he's going to let us hear from the works side of the the debate. He's going to give the works group the microphone and he's going to say, here, you present your argument against justification by faith. Here, works people, you stand up, you present your argument. And then he's in verse, um, in verse 18, then he is going to give the microphone to the faith side of the argument. He's going to say, you stand up and you say what's wrong with the work side. So here's what happens. The faith side stands up and they present this problem. Paul's presenting it as if they were presenting this problem. Here's what the works side might say. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. 
That's Paul saying, certainly not. But what the work site is saying is this. If we try and be justified by faith alone in Jesus, and then we break our law that God has given us, we have the freedom to break the law that God has given us, then aren't we going to be found sinners? And then if we believe in Christ by faith and we break the law that God has given us, does that mean that Christ is a servant of sin? Does that mean, in other words, that Christ is promoting sin? If he is allowing us to break the law of God and just live by faith alone, then is not Jesus promoting sin in our lives? Surely that's wrong. And that would be the Jewish mindset. Like if I'm going to believe in Christ by faith and ignore all of the food laws, doesn't that make me a sinner? And if Christ is telling me to ignore all the food laws, then isn't Christ a promoter of sin? It cannot, what they're saying, what the work site is saying is this, Jesus is not enough. We must do something else. That's what the work site is saying. They're standing up and saying faith in Jesus can't be enough. And if Jesus is telling us only to trust and believe in him, and then we have freedom to break the law, then surely Jesus is a promoter of sin, is a servant of sin. Do you know what Paul says to that? Certainly not. So he gives them the microphone. They stand up and they say, well, if this is the case, then Jesus must be a, a servant of sin, a promoter of sin. And Paul, it's as if Paul stands up in the audience and he's saying, no way. That argument is foolish. Absolutely not. And so in the Greek language, he uses the most significant no you could use. It's like no capital letters with, with a million exclamation marks. He gives them the microphone. They stand up. They make their point, And he shouts at them, no, sit down. Have you ever watched a debate happening? And you hear someone arguing on one side. And you're like, they are completely wrong. Sometimes I do watch debates. And I look at the debates. And I'm kind of like shouting at the screen. They're wrong. They're wrong. That's what Paul is doing. He's given them the mic. And they're saying, well, surely Jesus is serving the sin. He's saying, absolutely not. And one of the reasons I think we go after uh, works for our justification is because we actually ultimately have a wrong view of Jesus. That's their problem. They ultimately have a wrong view of Jesus. They are thinking ultimately that Jesus is not enough. And to somehow think that Jesus could be a promoter of sin, that is foolishness. And sometimes I think for us as Christians, most of our problems come from this, when we have a wrong view of Jesus. You know, you'll hear some Christians say, you know, you'll hear some Christians say, you know, we have to put Jesus first in our life. We have to put Jesus first on the list. That is a wrong view of Jesus. We don't put Jesus anywhere. Jesus isn't our buddy that we kind of take and we put him as the cherry on top of the cake of our life. We just add Jesus to our list. That's not Jesus. Jesus is the list. Jesus informs everything in our life. He is wholly other and wholly different to anything else that we would have in our life. It's not like I take Jesus and I, and I put him first somehow. No, he is preeminent. He is excellent. He is great. He is glorious. He is above all things. That is the right view of Jesus. And to view Jesus as a promoter of sin is utterly wrong. Because Jesus is ultimately blameless and without reproach. In 1 Peter 2 verse 22, it says of Jesus, he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. To say that Jesus is a promoter of sin is to not recognize what Jesus ultimately did on the cross. Can you imagine 
If you are the creator of all things and you are on the cross and you could stop it all in a moment and you choose with all that power to say nothing, that is our sinless savior. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect was tempted as we are, yet without sin. So that side, that work side of the argument, that would say that Jesus is a servant of sin or a promoter of sin, is utterly wrong. And that is why Paul stands up and says, you are wrong. So then what Paul does in the next verse is he takes the mic and he gives it over to the faith side of the argument. And he says this in verse 18. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. I do not sin by placing my faith and trust in Jesus. How I sin and make myself a lawbreaker and a transgressor is when I try and rebuild something that Jesus has already fulfilled and demolished. That's how I make myself a lawbreaker. When I try and fix what has already been broken. When I try and put back what he has already torn down. And so when I think of this, I think of this image in my head. I often think of images in my head. And when I think of things getting torn down or broken, I, I thought of my life as, as a young boy. I broke a lot of things as a young boy. I broke a lot of things. I broke um, windows unintentionally, intentionally. I broke uh, picture frames. I broke, um, I don't know what else. I broke loads of things. Dad probably has a bigger list for you than I do. I broke loads of things when I was younger. But as I was thinking of this verse, something came into my head. I remember playing soccer, football, in my friend's house. And we were playing football in the house, which, again, he wasn't allowed to do, and again, we weren't supposed to do. And we were kicking the ball in the house. And as we were kicking the ball in the house, I kicked the ball, and it hit a vase. And it hit the vase, and the vase did that kind of, you know, that kind of wobble. You kind of see it for, it like tipped the side of the vase. This is not drama. This is just what you see. It all goes slow motion. And you just see that wobble. It goes whoop, 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 and breaks. And you know what I did in that moment is what I think all of us do when we break something and out of panic. And I don't know why I did it, but you know what I did? I ran up to the vase and I tried to put it back together. Now, logically, that's foolishness. Logically, that makes no sense to take this vase and try and piece it together with no glue, no sellotape, no nothing. But in panic, you're trying to like, you know, hold it up and, and put it on top of where it was and kind of leave it go. And you can never do that. That is foolishness to try and rebuild something that has already been torn down, to try and rebuild something that is already broken. That is foolishness. And what Paul is saying is actually that's where the work side gets it wrong. It's done away with now. The food law is done now. The circumcision law is done now. It is not circumcision of the flesh. It is circumcision of the heart. It's done now in Jesus. And so to rebuild that, it's like running up to the vase and trying to put it all together. It's worthless. Buy a new one. Don't try and fix the old one. And we have a new one. And so when I think of things being torn down and this idea of what Jesus actually did in terms of, of works and faith and, and what Jesus accomplished on the cross, I do think of Jesus on the cross. On his final day when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it tells us in the scripture that Jesus, he breathed his last breath. And then it tells us in Matthew 27, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus died on the cross. He breathed his final breath. And the curtain of the temple, we are told, was torn in two from where? From top to bottom. 
Nobody is in the temple. And the moment Jesus breathes his last breath, the curtain, curtain of the Holy of Holies, which no one had access to, only the high priest once a year, that curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. It is as if God reaches down his hands, takes the curtain and rips it apart, which tells us something new is happening here, which tells us as God's people, there is open access for everybody who would believe. That you get open access to the Holy of Holies. You get open access to God himself. That is phenomenal. And so to say it is about works is for us to kind of try and take that curtain and stitch it back up again. That's breaking the law. That's what Paul is saying. Why, when you would have open access to God, that you could get to him in prayer, and get to him and reading the word and get to him whenever you want. Why would you make it about what you do when he's already achieved it all and said, come on in, come on in. And so what Paul is saying to them is that is not the way to solve the problem. What is the way to solve the problem? The only way to solve the problem of sin in our life is Jesus. It's Jesus. Because if it is by our works, then Jesus died for no reason at all. And that's the point he makes at the end of verse 21. He says in verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, if I could get right with God through the law, through the actions that I did, then Christ died for no purpose. His death if I say I can be made right by what I do and the works of the law, then his death, you're saying, is pointless. His death, you're saying, solves nothing. But the reality is, our solution is found in Jesus. He solves our problem. And Jesus solves our problem through his death. Jesus solves our problem through his life. And Jesus solves our problem through his love. Look at verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. When you believe in Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, you are so attached to Jesus that his death becomes your death. That is how the problem is solved, by faith and trust in Jesus who died. Do you know what we call marriage? We call marriage a union between man and woman. And when this union happens between man and woman, what happens is they get really attached, don't they? The two become one flesh. There is this perfect union. And what the scripture is actually saying to us is that the greatest human union that you could think of, probably marriage is one of them, the greatest human union is nothing, nothing compared to your union with Jesus when you believe in him by faith. Now, when you believe in Jesus by faith, you are more attached to him than any other human being could, you could be attached to. When Christ was crucified, so were you. That means that the old you is absolutely dead, done, finished. That doesn't mean that there isn't, isn't um, flesh within you and a desire in you, but you are totally, utterly new. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. This affects our identity. You are crucified now with Christ. His death changes everything. His death solves our problem. But not only does his death solve our problem, but what else solves our problem? It is life. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, verse 20, but Christ who lives in me. 
I am so attached to Jesus when I believe in him by faith that I have been crucified with him. And now I live with him. I have a new life. I am a new person in Christ. The old you, it is gone. It is gone. So then you think to yourself, why would we try and sew back up the curtain and make it all about what we do? I think there are a few reasons why we try and sew back up the curtain and make it all about our works. One of the things, one of the reasons is this. We like familiar things, don't we? We really like familiar things. So I'll put it to you this way. If you came in this morning and I was standing over there and all the seats were faced that way, you came in, how many of us would have a problem with that? Loads of us. I can see some of you even getting antsy at the thought of that. <laughs> Change. We're afraid of it. We love familiarity. We love the old way of things. You know, if I were, and even the order of service, I bet, I bet not many of us think about the order of service and how we do things. But if I was to flip it around, maybe the Lord's Supper at the start and the sermon at the end, if I was to flip that around, you would have a problem with that because we like the old order of things. We like the familiarity of things. We like our tradition. And so one of the ways, one of the reasons we go back to works and go back to the things of the law, and one of the reasons the Jews would have wanted to go back to works and back to the things of the law is because it is what they're familiar with. It's one of the reasons we want to sew back up the curtain. It's because we're, we like familiar things. The other reason we sew it back up is because we like controlling things, don't we? I mean, let's be honest. How many of us like controlling things? We like to be in control. And one of, the, the, um, one of the ways people can preach it's about works is because who's in control? We are. We get control. If we make it about works, we get control ultimately. And so what you will find happen even in this nation is what happens in this nation is we want so much control that we will even try and control the salvation of our children. Here's what we'll do. We will christen our children and we will pronounce salvation on our children because we want to control their salvation. And Paul would say, absolutely not. It is only by faith alone in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. It is not about our works. And even that control of salvation, that can even happen in, in our church too. Sometimes we're so desperate for our children to be saved that we will force almost a profession upon them. Oh, I think they said, I believe in Jesus. Let's write it down. Let's write down the date and make sure we know it for certain. No, salvation doesn't belong to you, parent. Salvation belongs to God. We're not in control of it. And so one of the things we need to do is say, God, I'm going to let go of these kids. And I'm going to trust salvation to you. And I know you're really good at saving people. So Lord, will you do it? And parents, it should drive us to our knees. Not drive us to make sure and, and try and orchestrate this salvation. And the other reason I think we try and sew up this curtain is this. Most of us, when we look real deep down, the reason we try and earn our way into heaven and do it by works, most of us were really insecure. When we think justified in Jesus, it's sometimes very hard to believe. So when I'm insecure about that, I'll try and amp up my performance in order to earn my salvation. And I'd love for us as a church to just admit at times, I'm insecure in my faith. I don't know where I stand with Jesus. 
And then I would love us as a church to try and speak truth back into each other's lives. No, you have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. Remember that, believer. And so one of the ways I think we as a church could really practically do this is through our our men's and women's groups on the Wednesday nights. I think if we went into those groups and we're honest about our insecurities. Here's where I'm at, lads. Here's where I'm at. And some of us admitted in, in, the, in the men's meeting the last time we had it, this, what we were talking about, some of us said, this is awkward. And then what we said is, how about we press into the awkwardness of what we're talking about? And I think sometimes we need to just come to each other and say, you know what? I'm doubting whether I'm really in Christ. I'm doubting whether I'm really justified here. And when you're feeling that doubt, you're going to want to run to your own works. But I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to just admit that to a brother or sister and then have them speak truth into your life. I think that would be a brilliant thing for our church to do as we move forward. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He solves our problem through his death. He solves our problem through his life. And he also solves our problem through his love. Look at the end of the verse. Verse 20. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I love the way Paul writes, because there he writes so very personally, doesn't he? This faith that we have isn't dry doctrine and theological truth. This faith that we have is personal. What Paul is coming and saying is, he loves me, and he gave himself up for me. And that's what captivates Paul's heart. That's why Paul was willing to be shipwrecked and beaten and go through all he did in his life because he realized it's not about works. It's about this. He loves me and he gave himself up for me. And so my question for you is, is this faith, this Jesus, personal to you? Can you say those words this morning? Jesus loves me. And Jesus gave himself up for me. It's personal. And I would love each of us to know that truth this morning and dwell in that truth this morning. He's mine. He gave himself up for me. He's mine. So when we sing his praises and when we live our lives for him, don't try and sew back up the curtain. It has been torn. (laughs) It is done. When Jesus said, it's finished, he meant it. He loves you and he gave himself up for you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the glorious truth of the gospel that we have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and I pray Lord that we as a church you would help us to come alongside each other and continually speak truth into each other's lives help that language just be normal to us each and every day help us to be a real community that is able to um, embrace our weakness and, and, and be vulnerable in many ways when we just haven't got it together. And I pray that we would not run back to our controlling ways or our familiar ways or our insecurities, but I pray that we would be totally and fully secure in who we are in Christ. In your name, I pray all these things. Amen. I'm going to stand and sing in response.